Paul, your mic's not on. All right, I don't know if Paul or folks online, can you hear me still? We can now. All right, sweet. All right, we're gonna get started a little bit, a, little, a couple minutes late. Uh, sorry, sorry about that, but uh, uh, so I'm Paul Severance. I'm the Novak Club president currently. Um, thank you all for coming. I know with a with a, uh, a Sunday nights in April are tough. There's there's always a, a special occasion, an observance, a holiday. Uh, this is a special day, obviously, being Easter, and uh, you know I hope you all had had a good Easter, spent some time with, with your family or friends and, and celebrate it as you, as you uh, normally do. Um, so, I, so I do appreciate you being here. It took, took extra effort and uh, appreciate that. Super excited to have Dr. Summers with us uh, tonight. Um, so interesting, you gotta, you gotta read his books. Um, he's just got such an imagin imaginative way of describing what life might be like on other planets. And it's just, it's super to have you here, Mike. Thank you so much for, for coming. So uh, we will get started. And I don't know if you can put that, is that as big as we can make that, Rob? Or uh, um, maybe, uh, that's, that's okay. Does it look okay online? That's the way we're presenting. Uh, it's probably fine. Okay, all right, so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so we'll start out uh, pretty much like we always do. I'll give you an update on what, what's been happening with Novak, what we've done in the past, and what, we, what we've got on our plate coming up. A lot of exciting things, a lot of opportunities for you guys to get involved. And, uh, you know, this is a great time of year. Getting, weather's getting warmer. Skies are going to be clear all week, I think. Uh, so perfect time for astronomy. And then we'll uh, have our uh, Dr. Summers uh, kick us off at, at the top of the hour. All right, next slide. Okay, bring you up to speed on what we've done in the last month or so. Um, great, great day uh, out at Robinson High School here on 18th of March. Every year, Novak supports this, the, uh, the regional science fairs here in the county. Um, super important because, you know, that's where the next generation of amateur hobbyists, like most of us, but also possibly professional astronomers are going to come from. So it's, it's really great that we support that. Harlan, thank you so much. You were a part of that whole group. Um, uh, did a great job. Tom Frazier uh, was our lead for that. And so super job. Like, uh, let's go to the next slide. I'll show you the results. And you know, Novak gets involved. We basically look for projects that are related to astronomy. Quite honestly, there's not that many. Um, you know, it's not sort of the core science that's taught so much. And so people, you know, really have to be motivated to do an astronomy project. So we celebrate that. Uh, we like to uh, pull those out and and uh, recognize those folks. Uh, Thomas Jefferson always always in the mix, pretty high, but also you can see uh, some some folks from Hayfield, Edison, uh, and uh, uh, participated as well. There's a couple of the of the topics you can see. I don't think I could have written these, so I mean. These are pretty smart kids, and we're going to invite them out to Astronomy Day, and they'll set up a little booth, and we'll have them talk to their posters out there if they if they choose to. So um, I think it's great, and thank you so much for the folks that supported that. All right, uh, next slide. All right, also on the 18th, so that was kind of in the morning, uh, but also on the 18th, we had two outreach events, one at Crockett Park and one at Sky Meadows. Um, a great job at Sky Meadows. Uh, you know that's always a super popular place to do outreach and astronomy. Um, but also at Crockett, we brought out uh, John Raymond. He had the idea of kind of setting up a, a collimation clinic, if you will. So people brought their telescopes that were, you know, not aligned properly, um, and he went around with his little toolkit. It was pretty cool. He had all kinds of little gadgets, um, and he helped us help people uh, uh, do all that work. So there's John. We're going to invite him back out at, at, for Astronomy Day, and so we're going to try to keep this going out at Crockett because I think it's really cool for people to get uh, kind of mentorship, if you will, and, and help uh, doing that. Uh, so thanks to John if you're on. Not sure, but uh, thank you so much. All right, and then uh, Novak on the Mall. This was just recently, uh, I guess last Sunday. Uh, yeah, last Sunday. Um, and I uh, appreciate Centil and Navin being there. Um, they're, they're here tonight as well. Uh, kind of late notice. We didn't give you guys a lot of heads, heads up on that. And a Sunday night driving down to the mall, 
the setup kind of late at night, you know, sunsets late, it's a big ask. So I really appreciate you guys being there. I think, how many did you did we actually have, Sintel, that, that you know of uh, down there? Yeah. Just just about five or six people. Yeah. Yeah. So And, you know, you can imagine the crowds down in the mall. So we had five people to support the volume of people that wandered through that area uh, looking, you know, looking in for astronomy. So uh, really appreciate you guys being there that night. Okay, so that's kind of what we've done. Uh, then I wanted to share with you some of the things we have coming up. Um, you know, I sent an email out saying, boy, there's like nine events. There's nine events we have coming up in April. So we're kind of partway through that, but we still have several here to go. <clears throat> so on the 15th, we, we again, will uh, we'll be at Sky Meadows, but we've also, we're also going to be out at uh, uh, BRCES, which is the Blue Ridge uh, uh, Center for Environmental Stewardship. It's going to become a state park soon, next few months. Um, and we've already got our feet on the ground to try and get observing privileges there and uh, support some events out, out there. And so we're kind of slowly walking through this right now. This is really our first public event, I believe, right, Alan? I think we've been out there, but it's we'll mostly for private. For, events, for private. private. So this is kind of a big deal. It's a big deal for the public because it's a new place to go. But for us, Novak, we want to have a really good show and turnout. Uh, because we hope this becomes then another observing site that you all can use. Uh, and it might be closer to where you live. It's, it's a pretty good location. Um, and so that's super exciting. Uh, that'll be next Saturday. Mention Sky Meadows, of course. Um, Meadowkirk. Um, we only go to Meadowkirk a few times a year on request from it's a, it's a, it's a Christian retreat center out in Middleburg, s super beautiful property. And they call when they have a group that wants some stargazing uh, activities. So, uh, but it's also another site that you guys can use, you know. So it's, uh, you know, take advantage of it. Come on out to Meadowkirk if you'd like. Uh, that's a Wednesday, so it's a bit odd. But, uh, you know, that's how, we, that's how we roll. And then a big day out at Crockett, Astronomy Day on the 22nd. Uh, we'll need some help for that. So if you have have a, a, you know, it's not a hard, heavy lift by any means. It's more or less greeting people, maybe sit a shift at a table. Uh, it's, a, it's a really fun event. So there's pictures of our four, four favorite places uh, as listed here. We're going to try to get the big bus to come out to Crockett. That was Corey um, Dollenmeyer, I believe his last name was, from, uh, he volunteered to, to bring his uh, uh, military grade, uh, uh, light uh, eyepieces and night light eyepieces, which really enhance the image uh, tremendously. So he's going to hopefully bring that back out. If you haven't looked through one of those, I mean, it's it's crazy. You can see you can see nebula just like you do in the books, not color, but you can bring out the the detail. Um, really super. All right, next. Uh, okay, I guess I pulled this slide in. Maybe you can play the video. Um, We'll get fancy here. See if it works. Um, this is uh, this is out at uh, uh, Blue Ridge. Uh, this is our event on the fifteenth. Uh, we'll get somebody to mow the grass. Don't worry about that. Uh, and like I said, the skies are always blue, always clear, right, Alan? So <laughs> no wind, no wind. there's no wind. Uh, yeah, it's a perfect site, right? But that's cool. Um, Pete Gorell, you remember Pete from last month, he was our keynote speaker here. He gave a talk on uh, how to measure distance in astronomy. And he volunteered to give a talk on meteors. So uh, Pete will be out there. They have, a little, uh, they have a little barn, as you saw, and we'll do the talk inside there. I think that starts at 8, right, Alan? 8 o'clock. So uh, come on out and help us with uh, the Blue Ridge event. All right, next. And people can stay as long as they want to observe. Okay, yeah, so uh, Alan said we can stay as late. I think the public will be there a couple hours, right. maybe kind of filter out, so you can get a real good uh, sense for what that'll be like. And then here's just kind of a shout-out to Astronomy Day, April 22nd out at Crockett. Uh, these are some past photos, obviously, um, uh, but we do need your help. So I, I put an email down here at Sandeep. Uh, you can jot that down if you like, if you want to come out and, and help us. I think he's got maybe a dozen volunteers so far, uh, but we really could use help. So 
we try to put on two like big events uh, a year for the club. This is one of them. We do one in the spring and then one in the fall. And so, you know, Cal will bring his meteorite collection. We'll have some activities for kids. We'll have a Novak tent. Um, we'll do a lot of things out of Crockett. So it's a, it's a super cool day to be out there. Uh, there is a rain date, so we, we you know, have the flexibility to, to, to cancel if weather is poor. So just keep that in mind as well. All right, next. And then this is just a reminder, other things we're doing. Uh, this is all out at Spruce Knob. This is a really terrific site out in West Virginia. It's about a three-hour drive from here. Uh, we have a relationship with the uh, uh, Spruce Knob folks, experimental learning. Uh, and uh, we have a star party called Night Owl that, that they are uh, doing the registration for. There's still open slots there if you, if you care to go out to, to that site. Uh, you can register online. Just Google Night Owl Star Party and it'll take you to the right spot. Um, we also have some camping slots that are actually free for Novak members. So I know there's some availability still for those. Um, so if you'd like to just get out and take a spot, um, contact Tom Semroff. He's our, he's our site lead out at, uh, for, for that site. Um, all right, next. Uh, I'd like to show you what's on Novak.com. This is one of our kind of where we like to drive you to, to see content and, you know, keep yourself up to date on what we're doing. So posted some things. Chris Spain does a great job of giving us kind of what's in the sky each month. So you'll see that. A little more detail on the science fair. You can click on that. Uh, we do have International Dark Sky Week coming up. Um, so that's a super important kind of uh, a whole range of activities that uh, we'll be participating in. But it's much bigger than Novak. So that's, that's coming up. You can read about that. We've also got an article from an interview with Tom Reinhardt, who is sitting right here. He is the president of the International Dark Sky Association. And so we have a really cool interview from, where were you interviewed? Borrego Springs, California. Bar Borrego Springs. You want to? The Dark Sky Spot, very active Dark Sky organization. You want to come up here, maybe? Sure, so sure. give us I, a. Uh, I travel in the winter, spend time in California and Arizona, and I was in Borrego Springs. And just today, sort of randomly got interviewed. Um, but what the interview is really about is all the changes that are coming in the International Dark Sky Association. I'm going to be speaking in two months here. Um, we're rebranding the organization. There's a new strategic plan. It's going to become a much more activist organization because we're losing the battle on light pollution. And we've got to turn that around. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, so I look forward to that. And Eileen. You, people don't realize Virginia is really the hot spot for dark sky activity on the East Coast. We have the most dark sky places. Eileen's getting more dark sky proclamations than anyone in the universe. And we really need to build on that, that activism here. And that's what my interview talks about. And you can read that or come hear me in two months. Sounds great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's cool to have a have a real insider like Tom on on your in your club. That's uh, fantastic. So, uh, so yeah, go on uh, Novak.com and you can read all of those. Next month we're going to have uh, Dr. Chris Walker. He's he's coming here from the University of Arizona. He'll be here physically. Uh, he's going to be our next speaker, and he'll talk about radio astronomy. I met uh, Chris when I went to the Oracle Star Party last year, and uh, he gave a great talk about doing astronomy literally from the South Pole. And so uh, it's kind of a cool thing. <laughs> no, no pun intended. <laughs> All right, next slide. All right, so yeah, I did, I did give a quick shout out to Dark Sky Week. It's coming up very soon. And uh, there's a whole website you can go to. There's all kinds of activities, educational, outreach, uh, what you can personally do at your own home, as well as just get the word out. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so we have a lot of heavy lifters here in the club. Eileen Craigie, uh, who will speak in a minute. Uh, Tom Leeton's our uh, Novak coordinator for Dark Skies. And uh, Tom Reinhardt, you just heard from. Um, as well as Bob Parks, who founded a, a smart uh, outdoor lighting company, um, or alliance, I should say. And so he works with both residential and commercial 
uh, <clears throat> development to try and you know put this stuff in the in the minds of developers as to the importance of lighting. So um, so Eileen, I want to have you come up and tell us about what you've done because you are a real you are the the real bulldog, and I mean that in the very <laughs> finest <laughs> message of the word. Uh, and here you can have this, and uh, yeah, I'll stand next to you. Okay, well, tell us about dark sky. Well, to start off with, uh, we've been requesting proclamations, you know, all over the uh, U.S. and um, across the globe. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, so a bunch of them have come in so far from this region. We've gotten proclamations from the governor uh, again this year from Virginia. Um, D.C. came in, Mary, uh, Mariel Bowser, she issued one. Uh, the governor from West Virginia. I'm waiting to hear from Maryland. Um, we've gotten the one from Ashland, Virginia has come in. Uh, tomorrow, town of Vienna and Falls Church City are coming in. Uh, one from the city of Alexandria came in. And what I think is really exciting about this one is that they very specifically mentioned the nuisance lighting of the athletic fields, and they specifically talk about light trespass and light pollution. And so one of the big things that we'll be pushing for is to get light trespass into the uh, local ordinances. In fact, the town of Vienna is redoing their ordinances now. And so it's really important if you know people there or whatnot, that they voice, that they, you know, to adopt the five principles of responsible outdoor light at night. And there's a brochure over there, a little card that shows what good lighting is and there's five principles. So I'm really excited about this. Um, 114 proclamations were requested across the US and 45 of them have been approved so far. So, yeah, um, so but I'm really happy that this That's, region is a, like a really good yeah. showing. That's amazing the work you do though to put to try to go out and get all of these. It's every I, every one is unique in terms of what you have to go through to get it. I'm sure, and we just appreciate it. Um, there's a couple more slides for you to talk to though. I want to keep you keep okay, you up yeah, here. Sure. So we'll go to the next one. Well, um, the things that you can do um, to take action is one: go to the International Dark Sky Association um, website that's specifically for International Dark Sky Week. There's a program called Globe at Night, and this is to be a citizen scientist, and families can get involved in it. You could take uh, just observations at night about the stars, the things that you can see. And what's important about it is that the researchers need multi-year data from light-polluted places. So they seem to have enough data uh, in dark from dark places. So the kids get different readings than adults. So I really encourage everybody to tell your you know, clubs, families, grandkids, whatever about at schools. The second thing is you can do an inventory for your own home lighting and again, encourage your neighbors to do that. You can self-certify your house as uh, dark sky friendly lighting. But one thing to do is to make sure that your lights are uh, focused downward and you all know this stuff, but not having them trespass outside your own property boundary. And like, for example, in my neighborhood, if any of the houses across the street you know, have light shining out, they're going to affect five houses, the two next to them and the three over here, plus the park behind us. So this is just a really good way to get people aware of it. And we have one more slide. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can always, okay, you can go out and <laughs> request a proclamation. I am more than happy to help anybody learn how to do that. And uh, the International Dark Sky Association, Amy Oliver, she has a great presentation about how to go and do this. And there's templates and wonderful information. And some of the upcoming you know, events for International Dark Sky Week is the two proclamations that'll be presented tomorrow night. This Lincoln Properties is a, one of the largest commercial um, management companies uh, of real estate in this area, uh, Maryland, DC, Virginia. And they wanna have, uh, George Mason come out and bring their inflatable planetarium out. And they were, they reached out, they want information, they want outreach to their tenants. And this is just a great way to get the word out. And I think they wanted, I don't know, it was like five or six different properties. They wanted people to do things out, whether we can or not, I don't know. But um, the 20th, the Vienna Green Expo, 
is coming up and that's just a great place to connect with people that are interested in you know all the environmental things and i made some great contacts there last year in fact one of the senior vice presidents from lincoln properties i met there um banshee reeks is a place out in loudon and they're doing some things for earth day and hopefully one of the uh, supervisors that's interested in the new park at the environment um, what is it blue ridge environmental yeah. center um will come out and read their proclamation so this is all great press and then the 28th wolf trap They've been trying for years to get a, a, an event together to have uh, telescopes out there. So they're going to be doing something out there and hopefully we can get a good showing out there. And yeah. so anyways, and I'm around if you need any now, help. Do you need help on the, uh, for tomorrow at either of those places? Do you want people from Novak to be there? Oh, yeah, there? that would be great. Uh, Falls yeah. Church City and uh, the town of Vienna. So they'll be both of them are at the... Uh, um, what do you call it? Yes. Courthouses. Okay. Courthouses. Yeah. So, so maybe then, they can. Uh, so if you're online, you're interested. We'd love to have you participate in those proclamations. You could maybe type your type your name in the chat box online, and then we'll get it to Eileen can coordinate with you. Correct. Yep. Yeah, or just we'll do that. Or show up. Just or just show up. <laughs> Come and okay. be heard. And anybody wants to help with the wolf trap, that would be great. Yeah. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Great job, Eileen. Um, all right so yeah she does a fantastic job of um of all of that legwork um so we really appreciate it okay we don't do this every uh every month but i did want to ask you guys tell me what you're doing astronomy wise um um this is the time when there's some awkward silence because usually people are reluctant to volunteer so i gave you some pointers anybody anybody done any of these things um you know there's been a lot of the messier marathon is like in full swing um we had this asteroid flyby i was going to try to go look for that it was like like one night right and and i think it was cloudy then high solar activity i looked at the sun even today with this new hydrogen alpha filter that we got for the club beautiful um stuff going on uh this is a picture actually kevin quinn took <laughs> I stole it off his uh, his uh, website here. You can see all of his stuff. But the asteroid Ceres transited across this uh, galaxy. This is Ceres up. I couldn't get the GIF to work. He of course had it animated. It was it was fantastic, right? Uh, really cool. And then of course NEEF. NEEF is this week. That's our big uh, Northeast Conference Expo for astronomy related things. I've never been. Would love to go to that. I can't do it this week, but. Um, so, so let's start here in the room. Uh, what have you guys been up to? There's the awkward silence. <laughs> hey, Tom. Oh, you did? All right. All right. That's cool. You saw it, though. Nice. All right. I'm not sure if you're hearing, any, hearing people online. We we're playing with IT here tonight. But anybody else? in the room how about online what are people looking at hey paul it's linda we still have online people <laughs> hey, <everybody too>. okay <laughs> okay all right so um a lot going on uh welcome new members too i don't know if anybody in the room is new member but pro we usually have new members both here and online so uh thanks for coming out uh, uh, and uh, yeah, next slide. Um, I did want to give a shout out to Alex Gorbachev. Uh, Gorbachev, um, he is actually going to be a speaker uh, this week up at NEF. Now, there's there's the expo itself, which is the weekend. Then prior to that, there's sort of an imaging conference. A lot of geeks get together and talk about imaging, right? Uh, Alex is going to be one of those, and I think that's super exciting uh, for, for him and for us, too, to have, uh, have a keynote speaker during that. He's going to talk about, uh, you know, field automation. He does a lot of great imaging. Um, he's always out at our outreach events and uh, super guy. So uh, look forward to hearing his experience. Maybe he can have him here next month, and he can tell us about that. So good job, Alex. Um, all right, Thanks, shout Bob. out for the solar eclipse. You all know it's coming, no surprise there. I think it's what, one year yesterday? 
one year from yesterday. So April yeah, yeah, super. What's that? So maybe saw some maybe saw my email regarding that site out for protection. We're literally in the very like end stage of getting contract and all that. The car will announce something. Okay. About for the, the Texas Star Party site. No, for um, the flip site that that he claims he has. He actually does that, but it's like okay. two steps away from releasing everything. So all right. I'm just letting you all know. Super, yeah. So Dan, uh, Dan here is mentioning that there's there's uh, potential to have some some field sites available for us, possibly uh, not free, but still having a place that you can go to. And it's Bortles, uh, so it's, it's a it's a great it's a great location in Texas for that too. So we'll shoot out information as we get that. I don't have any specifics necessarily right yet, but um, you should start making plans. Great opportunity Tuesday. Dial into. Uh, Alan's uh, Eclipse uh, Special Interest Group. Um, we'll have Jeff Ball, who is a fantastic YouTuber, does great videos, um, uh, and he's going to tell us how to photograph this Eclipse. So if you're a Novak member, uh, shoot us an email, president at novak.com. We'll get you set up if you're interested. If you're not already in that group, we'll get you in there, and you can, you can uh, uh, tap into this uh, uh, meeting on Tuesday. Right, Alan? So, all right, next slide. And just to, just to kind of uh, key off of that, we do have a lot of special interest groups in, in Novak. I, I like to remind you guys of some of those. Um, you know, we have a lot of heavy duty imaging folks that, that do the, do the uh, imaging SIG. Uh, we have a travelers group for the Eclipse. Obviously, that's going to dovetail right into that group. And then we have a 3D print SIG. Uh, you know, 3D parts are great. You can do all kinds of cool things. Here's a handle for a telescope. Um, here's a uh, here's a solar finder. That's for you, Alan, because I know you don't print much. I made one like that. Well, well, yeah, but yours was out of cardboard. This is a little better. <laughs> so, so you know, there's uh, my point. <laughs> my only point is. Uh, there's all kinds of cool things that you can print, right? That are have direct applicability to astronomy. We would love to have you, if you need something or you have an idea for something, talk to that print SIG because we're looking for things to print. Would love to custom make something for you, whether it's a spacer or a knob or a solar finder like Alan has now. He's, <laughs> he's, <laughs> so um, anyway, that's a fun group. We're trying to get a little more traction on that, uh, but uh, lots of cool things you can do with 3D printers. Dan, you're gonna be in that group too, if you're not already. So, <laughs> all right, next slide. And then uh, just another shout out to our loaner equipment uh, pool. We have a lot of great resources in Novak. One of them is you can check out telescopes just like you check out a book. And there's some pretty good stuff there. I mean, you've got the 8-inch uh, the SCT. That's a super popular scope, all go-to, computerized, everything. Uh, we've got a big refractor. There's some, there's some image-stabilized binoculars. All range of things. The whole point is to give you guys a taste for something before you actually commit your own money to buying it, right? So you can check it out, no cost. Uh, keep it a month, see what you think, and and return it. So uh, if you remember, that's a great benefit. And the solar filter, so you don't keep it forever. What's that? The solar filter. Oh, that's right. I should mention we did yeah, buy. I forget that. <laughs> I do forget that. <laughs> no. Uh, what's that? Filter? No, no. So we bought we bought we bought a hydrogen alpha filter. It's an eyepiece basically, the oh. the, the Daystar Quark. So we're going to take that and we're probably going to marry it up with a refractor. That's kind of a big one, but we're going to see what we can kind of marry it up with, and that'll be a, a loner kit that we can then send out. It's at the eyepiece. You got a lot of heat then. So you so depending on the size. Yeah, so well, so something that big, you need to put another uh, UV rejection filter in the image train or in the light train. But um, I've used it a few times, as Alan has indicated, um, and it's fantastic, right? And so I think what I'd like to do is get a little more solar outreach going in the club, and you know, pull together people that have these expensive lunts and other instruments. So this is something that had an interest. You could you could borrow this as long as you do some outreach for us with it, right? All right, next slide. I think that might be it. Uh, yeah, so uh, what we're going to do tonight is uh, we'll have Mike get set up here, um, and we're going to give away some books. So who didn't get a ticket? And we'll reboot here. 
So the awkward silence was really awkward silence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so. oh, Alan. Oh, there he is. Now, uh, now I have to. <laughs> I already sang your praises. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> Uh, so I said earlier, well, you know, I'm, I'm super stoked to have Mike Summers. Uh, um, he's written some books. I'm sure he's written articles and all kinds of things. He teaches here at GMU, um, planetary science. You got your PhD from Caltech. Um, he's got a degree in Russian. I'm not sure how that, how you got to that point, but I'm sure it's interesting. Um, but we last had you here about two years ago, but a year and a half maybe. Um, and you talked about uh, Ultima Thule, and he's he's part of the he was part of the uh, maybe still are part of the the, the New Horizons uh, science team. New Horizons was the spacecraft that went past Pluto, and then on to this other Kuiper Belt object. I mean, the science from that was just spectacular, and the imagery of Pluto would just shocked everyone. Um, so, what I like about Mike is is his books are so so imaginative in terms of understanding you know what we we can take what we know about a planet and we can apply some some stay within the bounds of physics what would life actually look like if you were on that planet or it, what would it what would it appear like um and he's uh, he's able to describe that in such an easy kind of like i said imaginative way to to get through so i think that's just terrific and uh we're going to give away a couple of books, and uh, he's going to stick around after this. To you've got other books, right? That you you're willing to Mike is willing to sell you at cost, which is like terrific. Maybe autograph them. I don't know if that costs a lot of extra, but I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, happy Easter, uh, and thank you, Paul, for the nice introduction. Um, and I believe this is the fourth time I talked to, talk to this group. Um, and the last three times it rained. So I was worried if I'd ever get invited back again. Um, so, but we don't have to worry about that tonight, hopefully. So uh, anyhow, I, I'm a planetary scientist and I study planets. I study pl how planets, how they form, how they, how they evolve over time and, and how they die. Um, and I like to think that I became um, a planetary scientist when I was about six years old. I grew up uh, out in the country, in, in western Kentucky, in fact, uh, far away from city lights. And at night, the sky maybe wasn't quite this brilliant, but it was pretty darn close. You could see the Milky Way every night. And from the time I was six years old, I was just enthralled by, by looking at the sky and trying to figure out or trying to just imagine what it would be like out there. And I, I, I liked science fiction at the time, and I dreamt of all sorts of worlds that might exist out there, which was fun, it was speculation, but we no longer have to dream about it. We're, we're studying these things. Um, when, when I started putting these slides together for this talk, um, right after uh, Paul had invited me, that was about 50 days ago, and I went and checked my notes, and in those 50 days, 167 new planets have been discovered. That's an average rate of more than three per day. We know of over 5,000 planets, a few hundred of them in what's called the Goldilocks zone. And we'll say a little bit more about that later. But just what we know so far, the implications are pretty staggering. I like big numbers. I'll just look at a few of these. And, as astronomers, you get tired of them, I'm sure. But I always just was amazed with, with big numbers, especially big numbers that really meant something. The, the, the Milky Way galaxy has, roughly speaking, 300 billion stars. That's about 30 times the number of people that have ever lived on Earth. So every person, you know, a, 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 about 10, 10 stars or something like that. If you estimate the total number of heartbeats of all the people that ever lived on Earth, you get a number about one in 20 zeros. If you add up all, or estimate the number of grains of sand on all the beaches of the Earth, you get a number of about one in 22 zeros. Based upon what we've learned so far about the distribution of planets and, and, and using what we've known as the lower limit, 
What this means is that the observable universe, not the entire universe that we can infer is out there, but the observable universe has on the order of one and 24 zeros habitable planets. I'll say Earth-like, I'm not gonna say habitable just yet. That means for every heartbeat of every person that's ever lived, there are 10,000 planets. I, I just find that so amazing to even think about and to try to, to, to wrap my mind around now that we're seeing, we're studying, we're learning what they're like. And, 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 it, and just existing in a, in a countryside home where I could see the stars at night got me really interested in the big questions. You know, is there life out there? You know, is there a creator? Is there a God? Does anything mean anything in, in this universe? Many of these questions are still speculation. What we can do, though, is that we can now do something we couldn't do 40, 50 years ago. Use the tools of science to ask to answer these questions that we've been asking. And, and that's the science of, that's a small part of the science of astrobiology. And if you go to, say, Google and type in, you know, what is astrobiology, you'll get a, a definition that looks a little bit like this. It'll say something about the, the multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary study of the origin, evolution, and distribution of life in the universe, which includes the history of life on Earth as well. And it's, it's, a, it's a huge topic, a topic that no one can really do justice to in a career, much less a 45-minute talk. And, and my research overlaps a tiny bit of this topic and that is the habitability of Earth-like planets, planets that are Earth-sized, rocky, metallic, and that exist around mostly stars like our own, some maybe a little bit cooler than our sun, like our dwarf stars. So I'm gonna talk about three little aspects of astrobiology. Um, and this comes out of some work that I'm doing right now on primarily Mars and Europa, and some of the a proposal I'm writing to study the atmosphere of Titan. So to, to talk about life in the universe, you gotta define, make some definitions, you know, what is life and what are we looking for? So I'm gonna say a few words about what we know about life on Earth to sort of inform this research. And then I'm gonna talk about some of these locales in our solar system that we believe are somewhat habitable uh, to some degree. And then I'll talk about habitability beyond our solar system, in particular exoplanets. Okay. So what do we mean by life? Well, first of all, I'm gonna narrow down the discussion to, to life as we understand it. So there's all sorts of speculation that there could be life based on silicon or sulfur or some other element. Let's just put all that aside. It's interesting speculation, but we don't know enough about it to really discuss it. Life as we know it is based upon the carbon atom because carbon atoms can bond together very strongly and create molecules that are very stable. You can create chains and rings and, and spheres and tubes and sheets and, and all sorts of interesting structures on which you can attach other molecules so that you can create things that are building blocks of proteins all the way up to amino acids and DNA and RNA. Life that we understand on Earth exhibits certain properties that we all learn about in middle school, growth, metabolism, motion, reproduction, response to stimuli, and Darwinian evolution. We have to be careful though when we're looking elsewhere for life as we know life on Earth, because there are exceptions to each of these criteria. Uh, for example, mosses don't really move that much. They're pretty much stuck where, they, where they're, they're growing. Fire grows and it metabolizes, but we don't really think about fire as being alive. Uh, crystals reproduce, in fact, they, they grow, but they're not alive either. So we have to be, we have to take this group of characteristics as a set when we're looking for, for signatures of life elsewhere. And that's a topic that I'll come back to right at the end when, when I talk about how do you detect life on distant planets. And then the other thing, and again, things that you, you all 
know about, just to remind you, all life on Earth requires three things. Uh, raw materials, inc including carbon, uh, a source of usable energy, not just any energy, but usable energy, usually thermal energy or, or light or chemical energy, and liquid water. Every form of life on Earth that we know of requires liquid water at some point in its life cycle. And water is kind of special too. Water, as you know, made up of two of the six most abundant elements in the universe. Not the 14th and 96th, but two of the six most abundant elements in the universe. So it's common. Although we didn't know that when I was a kid, we didn't know if there was water anywhere else in the universe. And now we realize that the earth is one of the drier places, even in our solar system. But water has some special characteristics that make it suitable for dissolving materials to get them into a cell or into an ecosystem and to get waste products out of that cell or out of that ecosystem. It also floats when it freezes. That can thermally isolate a lake from cold temperatures above it, which has implications for all sorts of, of living things from bacteria all the way up to fishes. Um, yeah, I think I've basically said that. Also, when you think about life on Earth, and, and based upon what we've, we've, we've done in terms of trying to inventory all the life that we find on Earth, there are still surprises. In fact, most life on Earth looks nothing like that picture. Although this is what probably comes to mind when you think about a rich biosphere on Earth. If you drill down below you right now, four to six kilometers and bring up rocks, you'll find bacteria in those rocks that haven't seen sunlight, the rocks haven't seen sunlight in hundreds of millions of years. And those bacteria are thriving because they get their energy, not from sunlight, at least not directly from sunlight, but from the chemical bonds in the minerals. And when you add up all the biomass underground that exceeds all the biomass in the, the living stuff that we can see with our eyes by about a factor of 250. That's most life on Earth. That's the dominant form of life on Earth. Not by intelligence, or at least we don't think so, but in terms of biomass, that's most life on Earth. So one of the first things that we learned from this, if you're looking for life elsewhere, you might want to consider the possibility of the dominant form of life on Earth, which is underground life, that's mostly in the form of bacteria, something we call extremophiles. And extremophiles are really interesting for all sorts of reasons. One is that they can live in, in just about every ecological niche, every natural environment on Earth, and even some environments on Earth that are completely unnatural, that are completely artificial. We find bacteria that live underneath glaciers, in, in water that's always frozen, at the bottom of the Marianas Trench that is six kilometers below the surface. We find life that's in the stratosphere. Sorry, I take sinus medication. It's really drying me out. This is the time of the year that I hate, but um, so I have to keep sipping some coffee for that. <clears throat> and one of the dominant places we find this type of organism, we call an extremophile, uh, is around mid-ocean ridges, what we call black smokers, where magma underground heats the ocean water that has seeped into the, the sub-ocean bottom, soils and, and detritus and, 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 and rocks, and it's been heated up until it's a form of steam, a very high pressure form of steam that brings itself, that breaks through the, the rocks and the soil and heats up the, the water to high temperatures just at the bottom of the ocean. We find rich ecological regions around those deep ocean mid ridges. And some of these are really bizarre creatures. Well, let me just mention that, you know, the, the diversity of things. We find organisms, as I said, that are really cold, that live as, at temperatures as much as 30 degrees below zero Celsius, to organisms that live above the boiling point of water the entire life above the boiling point of water. We find organisms that live at high pH, low pH, high acidity, low acidity, and so on. Just about every environment that you can imagine, we find living organisms. 
even inside of, I mentioned artificial environments, uh, the kind of environments that have been created in nuclear power plants where you have radioactive material that's giving off radioactivity, water that flows around it. And in that environment, the radiation is so intense that it would kill you and I in about 15 minutes. Yet organisms have evolved very quickly to adapt to that environment. And the way they do it is pretty darn interesting. Some of these organisms, and the name is a, a long name called Dionychus radiodurans. You have to practice a long time to be able to say that. And these things have backup DNAs, backup examples of DNA, as many as four to 10 backup copies for DNA. In addition, they have specialized enzymes that continually work their ways up and down the DNA to repair mistakes that occur. Pretty darn clever. We find organisms that live in the Atacama Desert where the salinity is over 30% by weight of the, of the soils on the surface and, and on and on. It just, it, about everywhere you look. And then there are subcategories that fill out the complete range of niches that we find. This is just for temperature. We find organisms that live over a broad range of low temperatures, I mentioned psychrophiles, and then intermediate types all the way up to the hypothermophiles that can live in boiling water, the kind of organism that we find in the, the, um, the lakes above uh, Yellowstone Park, where the bacteria have created some very beautiful uh, chemical regions around the lakes that we call the, the great prismatic uh, lakes and uh, the rainbow lakes. This is one of my favorites, the tardigrades. Um, ugly, uh, only a mother could love something like that. They can survive at temperatures 200 degrees below zero Celsius, 151 degrees Celsius. You can dry them out completely, just let them dry out completely on a, sh on a, on a sheet of glass and set them aside for two weeks and then come back and put water and they'll reanimate. You can freeze them solid and then let them thaw out and they're happy or as happy as I guess they could be. Uh, you can, they survive without oxygen. Um, they, and for a short period of time, they can survive without water at all, as I mentioned. Uh, they, I don't know who thought of this experiment, but even put them in boiling alcohol and they survived. And this has been called the, the, the most sophisticated form of life on earth, at least in terms of survivability, that might be true. Amazing little critters. Here's another one, and this is not from a, uh, one of the old B movies where you have something like the giant centipede you know, attacking a town. This is a methane ice form. This is a terrestrial organism. Um, this was found, they get up to about uh, two inches long, the biggest ones, about two inches long. They were found at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico in the sediments where there's a great deal of methane. Meth methane has been percolating up through the ground and is collected into a form of ice we call clathrates. And these worms live in that frozen methane called methane ice worms. And again, they thrive. They don't just exist, they thrive. This is uh, an organism a bit like the brine shrimp that students can sometimes, you know, or that, that often use for science fair projects and in schools. Um, they, they live in water, brine, that's as much as 30, 35% salt. And again, they thrive in that environment. <clears throat> when we look at Earth history, that's a little bit of a discontinuity. I'm going to be doing that several times, jumping around so I can get up to a punchline rather quickly without going into too much detail. When we look at Earth history, we can break it up into several rather distinct parts. The earliest time, the Hadean, when the Earth was forming. The Archean, when the continents were coming into being and growing to about their current size. The Proterozoic, when most of the oxygen the atmosphere started to rapidly increase. And then the Phanerozoic, the last half billion years or so of Earth history when most, life, most different body types have come into being. When, if, you were to, if you were to get into a time machine and just randomly pick any time in 
the last four and a half billion years and then get out of that time machine, you would suffocate. No oxygen, and not enough oxygen that you need. Many of the times in that history, you would you would be exposed to ultraviolet radiation that would cause skin cancer. A, a, a large organism wouldn't be able to survive in that type of environment. Not to say anything about the temperatures, the high temperatures that were present early on, and the other times when there were snowball Earth episodes. The point here is that most of Earth history has been an extreme environment. In other words, the dominant form of life on Earth now, in terms of biomass, it, it is made up of these organisms called streamophiles. And throughout most of history, our environment has been an extreme environment, again, from our perspective. And what this probably means, build up a little suspense there, is that the earliest forms of life on Earth were probably extremophiles. And there's you know, a great deal of speculation about where that happened in the deep ocean, around the mid-ocean ridges I was talking about, or perhaps in clays or around crystals, we don't know. But they were almost certainly extremophiles, just because the environments were extreme environments. And it's interesting that those are the kind of environments that we find on other planets. So you can recap you know, many of the major lessons from Earth history that informs our search for life elsewhere. And in really one slide, the age of the Earth, four and a half billion years or so. Life orig originated really early. We have fossils that, of cells that date back to three and a half billion years. And there are isotopic signatures of life that go back down to 4.2 billion years. In fact, life may have originated many times, dozens of times, and been uh, extinguished by um, uh, large asteroid impacts, asteroids the size of, say, Texas, that would vaporize all the oceans on Earth, because those were hitting the Earth every million years or so around the time that we feel that life uh, originated on Earth. All life um, on Earth needs those three things I mentioned, liquid water, usable energy, and the raw materials. And another thing that is, is important if you're thinking about looking for life elsewhere and, and that is that there's this idea that life and, and the Earth have actually co-evolved. You know, the, the Earth has guided the evolution of life, but what life has done has changed the environment of the Earth. Uh, and you don't have to look very far to see an example that oxygen. Oxygen wasn't here before photosynthesis, or it was here, but in very tiny amounts. And once oxygen became a dominant part of the atmosphere, the oxidation state of the atmosphere changed dramatically and organisms evolved that could utilize oxygen in their metabolism and become much more efficient. Um, again, some things to think about when you're looking elsewhere, look for regions, look for planets where you see evolution along directions that you would not expect. And that most life on Earth now and in Earth hist history has been of the form of an extremophile. Okay, so taking those simple ideas, now let's just look at our solar system. And I'm not going to get everything in our solar system. There's too many, too much real estate to just spend topics on that. But take a real simple perspective. You can rule out our sun for any kind of life that we've talked about so far on Earth. Maybe not necessarily some of the coolest brown dwarfs that are out there, but certainly our sun. You can rule out the smaller asteroids. Not Ceres, by the way. Ceres has an internal ocean of brine. I don't know if you knew that, but it's, it, it would be habitable at least from that perspective, for things like brine shrimp. So you could rule out comets and asteroids, but it's surprising most of the planets, most of the nine classical planets have liquid water someplace inside them or on their surface or in their atmospheres. They tend to be stable for long periods of times, billions of years. They tend to have several different kinds of energy that's available to support the energetics, the metabolism of organisms. And, and they, they have a really diverse mix of, of processes and, and a really large amount of energy flow that causes regions to occur in, in these planets that reduce the entropy. In other words, you get complexity driven by the energy flow. Now, it, there's a temptation here, and, and the way the science of astrobiology has developed has, has really followed that temptation. And that is to, to define life the way we 
think about life on Earth. Again, you think about life on Earth, you say, well, we need liquid water on Earth for life. But most life is not on Earth, it's inside of the Earth. So that's where you'd want to look for liquid water. But if you limit the discussion to planets or moons that have liquid water on their surfaces, then you're severely limited to a tight range of distances from the sun, which we call the, the habitable zone. Earth is on the inner part of that. Venus is too hot. Mars is on the outside edge. It's kind of interesting. In the highest part of the summer on Mars, there are a few regions right at the equator that get just warm enough for you to get liquid water. They're really small and really transient. So Mars is really, truly right on the outside edge of that, that envelope. And that's given rise to, to this perspective. And this is what I learned in school. You know, Venus too hot, Mars too cold, the Earth just right, like a Goldilocks story. But it's not that simple. I hadn't been, been thinking about talking about Venus here um, in, a, in a discussion of astrobiology for sort of obvious reasons. Venus is really hot, right? I mean, if I had my laptop on the surface of Venus, it would melt in about 10 minutes. You don't think about life existing there. And just this week, there was an announcement of another uh, piece of evidence that showed that Venus is active volcanism. We knew that there were plumes of sulfur dioxide being ejected into the atmosphere. And now we see that there are regions around volcanic caldera where there's been magma flow. And so Venus is seriously active, lots of energy flow, no liquid water on the surface. How many of you think there's any place on Venus where you could have life as we know it on Earth? Anyone? I've got a few people brave enough to vote. What I tell my class is that it's, it's, I'm a dictator, but it's an autocratic democracy. You have to vote, you're required to vote, okay? So how many think that you could have life anywhere on Venus? Life as we understand it, law of Hitler. How many think not? Interesting. Well, it turns out that if you go up to where the clouds are, where the clouds are, you know, a mix of sulfuric acid and water, the temperature is, you know, it varies a bit, but it's around the temperature that you find uh, that's room temperature, this room here. And when you simulate this environment in a laboratory, the acidophiles I was talking about earlier, the kind that you would find in the, the, the hot geyser source pools in Yellowstone Park, they thrive in this environment. In, in a planet where the surface temperature melts lead and it rains sulfuric acid everywhere, pole to pole, day and night, and, but not a drop of it ever gets to the ground because it's too hot, there is a region that is habitable from the pers perspective if you are using the Goldilocks as a guideline. So I'm gonna say about Venus though. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about Venus over the past year, about or two years, about the discussion of phosphine in the atmosphere. Is that being an indication of uh, uh, alien biochemistry? I think the consensus is that it's not for, for several different reasons. Um, but Mars, Mars is very interesting, whoops. Missing a slide. Am I supposed to take questions during this or? Um, mostly online though, so we'll, we'll go through them at the end. Okay, sounds good. So Mars, I mean, when Mariner 4 went past Mars in the 1960s, uh, people, you know, most of the scientists I knew were pretty depressed. It looked pretty dead. And it does, it looks dry. It looks like a, a high altitude desert on Earth. But it's pretty clear it's had an interesting history. There are canyons thousands of times bigger than the Grand Canyon. There are volcanoes the size of New Mexico that may still be somewhat active. We see many evidences that water was flowing on the surface freely and in, uh, in, in turbulent and gigantic floods over a period of a few hundred million years early in its, early in its history. So there was, there was a hydrosphere in addition to catastrophic events which released lots of liquid water. And there's, there's abundant evidence now, from, mostly from the rovers that we've had on the surface of Mars, of water infiltrating uh, sedimentary deposits and volcanic deposits and creating um, 
uh, crystalline structures that you produce by water mixing with these things like magnetite or siderite or something like that. And these are, this is an example, these were called blueberries. And uh, there, are, there are lots of them. And, it's, and when they're made basically iron, and when that is oxidized, that gives you something that's a lot like rust. And that's why Mars is red, because of the water that was present early in, in Martian history. When you work backwards, looking at Mars now, and estimate how much you, water you need to produce the sedimentary rocks, how much you need to produce the, the water formed minerals, the aqueous minerals, how much water you need to, to produce the flood deposits, and, 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 and so on. And then there are other evidences too, which are more physics uh, related, like you know, looking at the isotopic ratios in, uh, of nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere. That can tell you how much the atmosphere has evolved over time and how much uh, water you've lost. Mars at one, one time had at least four, the equivalent of a four kilometer deep ocean all over its surface, okay? A, a, an object lesson in climate change, if there ever was one. This is of course an artist reconstruction. We didn't have pictures available of this, but a large portion, probably 40% of the surface of Mars was covered in water. Is Mars habitable now? As I said, now, if you use just a liquid water as a criteria, the answer would have to be no, except for those very tiny places at the equator at the peak of summer heating. And there are other things that make Mars hostile to life. The atmospheric chemistry naturally produces something called hy uh, hydrogen peroxide. It's exactly what you find that you use in, uh, in, in your medicine cabinet to dab on cut to kill bacteria. So it's, um, it uh, destroys skin tissue at the same time. That is produced in the atmosphere and it, it's sedimenting down onto the soils. And the top few centimeters of the soil uh, are saturated in hydrogen peroxide. Ultraviolet radiation penetrates to the surface. There's no ozone layer. But if you go, and so the surface cannot be considered habitable from the, the normal perspective that we would consider habitability. But underground, there's plenty of carbon and raw materials. There's plenty of chemical and geothermal energy. I should say plenty of chemical energy. Geothermal energy is there, but we can't quantify that just yet. And there's a lot of water, but you don't see it. In fact, most of the water that was present on Mars early in its history is still there. Again, it's not invisible. It seeped underground. Now on the Earth, the water cycle has taken water that's been trapped in sediments and brought that back up through the atmosphere by volcan volcanoes. But on Mars, the, we didn't have, they didn't have plate tectonics. So water that's trapped in, trapped in sediments remain in sediments, and as the surface cooled over time, it froze. This is just one map of the top two meters or so of neutron scattering uh, over the surface of Mars. Where it's blue, that means there's a lot of hydrogen. Where it's red, that means basically no hydrogen. And here, hydrogen would be a proxy for water. So we have the lowest regions in Mars. It's clear that there's a lot of water, and there's probably frozen water that goes down hundreds of meters. And below that, there's probably lots of regions where you have liquid water. In fact, that's a recent discovery. Of underground lakes on Mars, this was detected, this is actual data, detected by radar signals from a satellite that um, were, were directed downwards. And you get reflection, of course, off the surface, different rock layers. Uh, top of the water layer, the bottom of it, and so on. And, and this bright region right here is an underground lake on Mars. Probably salty, but it's there. And, and this particular one is very close to the South Pole. And that shows you the, the inset there close. This is the South Pole. And this region right here is where it is in relation to the South Pole. Of course, we haven't really done a, a synoptic type survey of these on Mars to see how prevalent they are, but there's water there. So Mars life. This is, when I was growing up, I had this favorite book, and it was a National Geographic book called Picture Atlas of Our Universe. And, and for every planet, 
an artist and a scientist got together and dreamt up what life would be like on that planet. And it, it'd be fun to go through all of them here. I just picked this one. On Mars, they imagined that the, the, the dominant life form be something they called a water seeker. Had big ears because the air is thin and have to hear very well, so big ears for that. Uh, they have a long nose and probe underground to get water. Um, the, the ears would actually wrap around itself at night to keep it warm and to keep it you know, alive during the cold night. But if there's life on Mars, it's not going to be anything like that. It's going to be this. Uh, bacteria, the kind of bacteria that's producing the, met, the, the methane that's in this room, about five out of every million molecules in this room, a bit more, is made up of methane produced by biology mostly. And these are called methanogenic bacteria. And they're common on Earth. And they take things like carbon dioxide and hydrogen, uh, um, molecular hydrogen, and use that to produce the, the, the molecules they need for energy and for building cell structures, and they release methane as a byproduct. Well, when, in 2001, I was working with an undergraduate here, and she was very interested in the possibility of life on Mars. So I just gave her an assignment. I said, let's go to the literature and see if you can find anyone that's ever simulated the Martian environment in a laboratory. And we found that there was a, this guy in Arkansas who had simulated the Martian environment. And what he found was that methanogens, the kind that you find on Earth, you could dump them in there and they always thrived. As long as you had you know, uh, carbon dioxide and, and, or, or H2, they would, they would live. So what we did is we, we wrote a paper and we predicted how much methane would be in the atmosphere if there were bacteria underneath the surface. And it turns out methane two years later was detected at within a factor of two of what we predicted. And it, it's, it's interesting because that does not prove that there's methanogenic bacteria on Mars. What it proves is that there's methane on Mars that should not be there because methane is not stable. Methane is oxidized by the oxygen in the atmosphere. It's fertilized by solar ultraviolet radiation. And the lifetime of methane is about 100 years or less. So what does it mean? We don't, we, we're still not sure. It's still a bit of a mystery. Um, but when you look at the methane on Earth, the methane production, uh, there are two dominant sources, mostly biogenic, but there is a geochemical form that you can get when you have water that's percolated through magma. We don't believe there's any magma on the surface of Mars just yet, but or at least right now, there was at one time. But this methane, methane that we see has been produced in the last 50 to 100 years. So the geochemical sources of methane that we understand are probably not the source of this methane. Now, the other types of methane that you can get in sedimentary rocks by, by, by low temperature, long-term exposure. But again, we don't really have enough information to sort that out. But there is one thing that, that, that does allow you to determine whether or not the methane is biogenic or, and, or not. And that is that not all methane molecules are the same. Carbon comes in three different isotopes, carbon 12, 13, and 14. Carbon 12, most abundant, is what life on Earth has evolved to utilize because it's the most abundant carbon in the atmosphere. Carbon 13 is far less abundant, about a percent of all the carbon uh, in the atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, but it's 100 times less abundant, so it's harder to detect. And carbon-14 is not particularly useful for this because it has a half-life of, of just about 6,000 years. So the, the way to de determine whether, you know, let me back up a bit, the way to determine whether or not the methane is biogenic is to look at the isotopic signature. And, and there's several attempts right now to do that. So what is this a big deal? Well, it's possible that we've already detected a signature of life on Mars. It's not convincing because it's not, it's not even anywhere close to proof. It is consistent, but we've got a long way to go. An isotopic signature would be the way to do it. But it's tough, it's really hard because to get that isotopic signature, we have to detect the methane 
at, uh, at levels at least 100 times more sensitive than we can now, even with detectors on the surface at starting. The lesson that I'm going to come back to if I have time to talk about exoplanets is that this would be the same way we would determine whether or not the methane on an exoplanet is biogenic or whether it comes from some chemical source. It's to look at, at other uh, organic molecules, their abundances, look at the suite of molecules, and in particular, look at their isotopic abundances of carbon and hydrogen and perhaps other things. There are some other clues. We find the methane coming out of Mars in just very specific regions, not everywhere. Uh, I won't go into that chemistry just yet. We also find that the methane co is coming out of Mars in plumes during the warm summer months. Okay, what does that mean? We're not sure. Uh, in fact, I shouldn't say we're not sure. We have no idea. Um, yeah, let's skip over that. But it's related to another problem that we don't understand, and that is we also see oxygen coming out of the sub subsurface of Mars. Not a lot of it, but it's certainly there, and the profile, the temporal profile, is the same as that of methane to the degree that we can determine it. And I'm just going to leave that there because I want to move on. I'm going a little bit slower than I expected to. So let's jump out to the orbit of Jupiter and look at some of the moons. And I'll just talk about two of them. Io is the, the moon I did my PhD thesis on. Um, the first paper that was ever published on supersonic meteorology, supersonic wind, supersonic weather. Really a, a bizarre place. And normally it's not the kind of place that you would look to if you're thinking about astrobiology. It's the most volcanically active object in our solar system. No water, as far as we can tell. The limits of observation, no water. It's all boiled away into space. At any given moment, there are about 300 or so volcanoes going off. Some of them are really spectacular. Here is a, uh, a set of images stacked together to produce a little sequence of a volcanic plume. This was detected when New Horizons pass, passed through the Jupiter system. That's shooting material 300 kilometers into space and falling back down. It's a huge volcano with an enormous amount of energy that's driving the interior of this object to be molten. And that energy comes from tidal dissipation between Jupiter, Io, and three of the moons, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto in the system. They continually flex Io and do friction, heat up the interior, causing the interior to be molten, releasing energy, which creates buoyancy and drives huge amounts, vast amounts of volcanism. Io actually it turns itself inside out every 200 million years because of the, the active volcanism. Okay, probably not life there as we understand life, but if you go to the next moon out, we get something, a moon that looks very different. It's a very bright moon called Europa, very reflective. It has lots of cracks. Cracks are, have dark material in the, in the center of these cracks. And now we know it has an ocean of liquid water. This is a, an ice world or an ocean world. Uh, and the ocean, lies under an ice layer, somewhere between six and maybe 60 kilometers thick, depending on where you are. The ocean is somewhere between 150 and 300 kilometers thick. So there's just a little bit more liquid water here than in all the oceans on Earth combined, in this one moon. And the, 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 they go on a little bit short. So, and the cracks, when you look at those up careful, uh, up closely and carefully, you see that in, in the cracks, in the fissures themselves, we see complex chemical structures. We can't identify find them just yet. Um, so I won't go, I mean, yeah, I won't go in, any further than that. But the, the, this dark brownish, reddish material, whatever it is, appears to be pr being produced in the ocean underneath and somehow being forced up through the cracks and fissures onto the surface. And then there are some areas where we see that the surface has actually been broken up into pieces, like a jigsaw puzzle, and then shifted, and then refrozen into another configuration. And if you're patient, you could cut these out and then move them back around, and you could imagine what the, the surface really looked like originally. But, whoops. The, the point of that is that we, the same energy that's causing Io to be volcanically active 
is heating up the subsurface of Europa and causing it to be volcanically active. But that's at the bottom of a 300 kilometer deep ocean. And all we see at the top is where the heat sometimes gets high enough to create plumes of water coming out of the cracks and where the, the heat will carry up chemicals that are produced in here and deposit them on the surface. So it's interesting, Io and Europa are very much alike, except that Europa has a layer of water and then ice on top of it. This ocean is at room temperature. Is it habitable? Yeah, from all the, the simple perspectives of the Goldilocks perspective, this is a habitable place. With more liquid water than I said, as I said, than in all the oceans on Earth combined. Is there life there? We have no clue, but it's intriguing nonetheless. And um, if things go well, um, the European Space Agency is launching the Juice Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer uh, this coming Thursday at, I guess it's 8.15 in the morning, no, 9.15 in the morning, Eastern time. I hope it works. They're having two really close flybys of, of Europa and hopefully measure the composition, I should say determine the composition of that dark material that's coming out of the interior from the oceans. Now, Jupiter has two other moons, Ganymede and Callisto, that have more liquid water than even Europa. But that water is underneath an even thicker ice layer. So we'll pass on those, on those two for now. What time do you want me to stop? Yeah, I'm almost done. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Saturn, of course, a beautiful, interesting, intriguing planet. I just want to say something about two of the moons, Titan. Titan is a moon with a very uh, uh, a, a very interesting atmosphere. Of course, all these are interesting. I'm an atmospheric scientist that study atmospheres, so they're all interesting. But this, this atmosphere is nitrogen, the same stuff you're breathing, about one and a half times sea, uh, sea level pressure on, on Titan, that much nitrogen. Also has a small amount of methane, a few percent. And the methane chemically is, is chemically converted in the atmosphere from solar ultraviolet radiation into complex organics, which are laying out on, on the surface. And it's been doing this for billions of years. And that has created lakes of complex organics, complex organic compounds. And, and we've been able to take pictures of those. Um, the cassini huygens probe um, that went through the atmosphere, took pictures on the way down of, of creeks and, and rivers and lakes and seas of these complex organics. The, the mass spectrometer on board determined that there were dozens of complex organic molecules in the atmosphere itself. Uh, the rocks are very eroded. They're not at all angular and fractured like the, the Mars rocks. It's clear evidence of some kind of atmospheric or, or, or water erosion. And this is a picture looking down, scale of about 20 kilometers. These are creeks going from the highlands down to the seas at, at low elevation. This is a picture from the Cassini spacecraft looking at the close to the southern pole on Titan. And see that bright spot up there, that is sunlight. That's the sun glint off of a lake of methane and ethane and complex organics. And in those lakes, and all the, the blue uh, that you can see with bright edges, all that is a, a large lake. You might call it an inland sea. Strange things, there are islands. And some of these islands appear to float and sometimes sink. How do you get a whole island kilometers across to sometimes float and bob up and down like a cork? But there it is, and it's gone there. A lot of interesting problems there. But here, you have an even larger amount of liquid water. You have an atmosphere that produces complex organics. You've got energy from the interior. You've got thermal energy. You've got tidal dissipation. You've got chemical energy. That is setting on an ocean of liquid water, which is setting itself on an even thicker layer of high temperature, of, sorry, high pressure water, which is ice six. Uh, you may not have heard of this, but there, there are at least 20 different forms of ice, more than the three, or of water, more than the three you learn about in school, solid liquid gas. Ice six is actually an ice that's crystalline, but the temperature is above the, the boiling point of water on the surface of the earth, called hot ice. But there's 
about 20 times as much liquid water, not including the hot ice, here in that dark blue layer than in all the oceans on Earth combined. So we're not done, but there, there are four places, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and Titan, each one of which has more liquid water than on, on Earth. Enceladus, completely different type of moon, tiny, comparing to, to England, Scotland, and Ireland. It's just a few hundred kilometers across. But the Cassini spacecraft did, saw geysers of material, steam, coming out of the interior, being shot into space. There's a lot of water, of course, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, simple and complex organic materials. And now we've even found benzene molecules and we found molecular hydrogen. Remember we were talking about molecular hydrogen and CO and Mars before, the, the food for, for methanogens. In fact, molecular hydrogen is like candy to many of these types of bacteria. So it too has an ocean of liquid water underneath an ice layer Tidal dissipation with the other moons and with Saturn is causing it to heat, uh, heat up a lot um, to high temperatures, as much as maybe 1500 degrees Kelvin. And the, the underground or underwater, uh, say sub, undersea, I guess that's a, as good a word as anything else. The undersea volcanoes there have a completely different character to the volcanoes on Europa or Io or Venus or the Earth, but they nonetheless do the same type of thing, heat up the water and cause it to be chemically rich because of its interactions with other materials. So Europa and Enceladus are two of the places that many of us think that if you want to find life elsewhere in our solar system, that's the best place to go. But it's by far not the only places. I don't want to say a lot about Pluto, one of my favorite planets. Um, but we did make a few sort of profound discoveries, one of which was called an ice volcano, a prior volcano. Um, it sounds like a contradiction in terms, almost an ice volcano, but you know how, or you probably have some sense of how volcanoes work on Earth. Magma, deep underground, under high pressure, forces its way up through cracks and fissures and explodes onto the surface. The magma cools and you build up constructs, which are different forms of different types of volcanic structures. This is a caldera of an ice volcano. Deep in the interior of Pluto, which is, when this picture was taken, Pluto was 31 times further away from the sun than the Earth is. The surface temperature at this time was about 37 degrees Kelvin. At that temperature, water ice is, has a tensile strength of steel. And yet here's a volcano that is powered by liquid water in the interior, forcing it its way up through cracks and fissures, exploding onto the surface and freezing, building up an ice volcano. Pluto too has an ocean of liquid water. Now this was taken from a, from a different talk, so I don't want to, to go into the details or find those, or the balls there, but the point is that there's, there, there's an ocean of liquid water even inside of Pluto. And there are other Kuiper Belt objects that we suspect that there might be oceans of liquid water. In, in addition to Ceres uh, and one of the moons of, of um, the, the moon uh, trite of um, Neptune. So you remember this picture, the Goldilocks zone, the Goldilocks perspective I told you earlier. This is the, the more up-to-date version Mars ha has a potential of an underground biosphere. Titan, a natural organic laboratory, ocean of water. Europa, largest liquid water ocean in the solar system. Enceladus, with geysers coming out. Even Pluto, and we're not even done there. The two other moons of Jupiter, Ganymede and Callisto, and Triton, the dimension. Ten bodies in our solar system that are all habitable from the simple perspective of having liquid water. Now, we know that, that life needs more than that. The point is that that simple perspective of having the existence of liquid water as a requirement for life is met throughout our solar system. And now we even know that, that many of the type of rogue planets that float around between the stars are gonna have uh, internal heat sources sufficient to keep liquid water inside of them for billions of years. 
Um, so how should I wrap it up or? I'm sorry. Uh, hopefully I'll do it sooner than that. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is one of the, the projects that I'm working on now. How do you, first of all, define habitability of planets? How do you do that? It's not an easy thing to do, as you might imagine, because planets are so diverse. How do you then detect to how do you detect life on other worlds? As if if they're not ETs warping around in spacecraft and dropping in on you every cat every now and then. If they're not like that, if they're not in advanced civilization, which even they might be hard to detect. But if it's simple, something simple like the dominant form of life on Earth, how would you detect it? And my my best guess, and a lot of people have worked on this. I, I'm by far not one of the leaders here, but I have a, a niche that I'm looking at using Mars as the guide for what I do, Mars and Pluto. And it, it, it's not an easy thing to do. And, and in fact, we don't, I'm not sure we have an ironclad proof for or against life on another world, whether or not it's orbiting in, a, in the Goldilocks zone and orbiting a distant star. I'm not sure we have that. It's a very tough, tough cookie to crack. Or, t let's see. A little bit about exoplanets, and this is stuff I'm sure you've heard about before, um, at least in, in broad brush strokes from the, the media. This is a little bit of an older plot, but this this is just kind of gives you a sense of the kind of planets we're finding elsewhere. Um, the first type of planet that was found in abundance was the, the hot Jupiters, the, the Jupiter size or Jupiter mass objects that a little bit mass, more massive than those that orbited close to the central star. Um, and those would orbit with orbital periods between maybe an Earth day and maybe 10 Earth days with masses, or here in radii, 10 to maybe 40 times the radius of the Earth. And then there are the cold giants, sometimes called ice giants and ocean worlds, so the overlap of these, like Jupiter and Saturn. The ocean worlds, the large ones like Uranus and Neptune that have a lot of methane and, and um, um, ammonia and uh, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. And then the rocky planets like the Earth, big slice of them right here. And then the lava worlds, rocky planets like the Earth that are very close in. We don't know, these were, were able to see that they have identifiable populations and we see their boundaries a little bit, but this we don't. But already you can tell that rocky planets with rocks, and metals, we say rocky, just the shorthand, we mean rocks and metals like the earth. They're the dominant form of plant that we've been able to, to detect. Um, and uh, when I say dominant form, I'm talking about maybe 30% of all the planets we've, been, we've detected so far are probably rocky and metallic. We can't say enough about the most recent ones to say whether or not they're habitable or not. But again, this is a huge number of places, 10 places in our solar system that is habitable from the perspective of the Goldilocks zone. Basically, I think it's what it's telling us that using the Goldilocks perspective, using a habitable zone perspective is not very really useful at all. What do you replace that with? I'm not sure yet. We've got some ideas, but I'm just not sure. And we're seeing some very interesting cases. I, I mean, TRAPPIST-1 has seven Earth-sized planets. Two of them, B and, and C, are very close to the central star. And we now know that B is very hot too hot to be in the Goldilocks zone. Uh, C is probably too hot as well, but it's borderline. D, uh, E, F, and G are all in the right range, depending upon the, the measure of the greenhouse effect or the measure of the, at the atmosphere on its surface temperature. They could, in each of those could have water, uh, liquid water on the surface. H, probably too cold. It's a very tight system. You got seven Earth-sized planets in a system down here that's smaller than the system of Jupiter and its moons. And it has seven Earth-like planets there. Now, the, the numbers keep going back and forth a little bit, but these three objects here have somewhere between 5% and 20% by mass, we think, liquid water, which would mean that they would have probably oceans of water exposed to an atmosphere, which is warm enough so you wouldn't have an ice surface. Ice worlds, you know, 
we have candidates on Earth that would fit right in to the ice worlds that we've been talking about. The methane ice worm, or the psychrophiles, or many types of methanogens. The water worlds, you know, the, there are some worlds that are not just water covered, but they're water through and through. For 85% of the whole planet is H2O. Uh, a planet that is, you know, has an ocean 8,000 kilometers thick. GJ1214b is one of my favorites. This is the Earth by comparison to GJ1214b, and this is the ocean, and this is the core, which is about the size of the Earth. You've got an ocean which encompasses probably at least 15 different phases of water, like an onion skin. You go through one phase, you get one character of water. Another phase, you get another character. When I say character, I'm talking about the crystalline structure, about the molecular properties, about the thermal conductivity, about the viscosity. So you can, in principle, have, have different layers for different forms of life in this, in this planet. And there are giant planets, too. Um, this one um, was nicknamed the, the uh, what is it, the, the what's, what's that movie with the giant um, dinosaur, Godzilla. Yeah, that's what we call the Godzilla planet. 17 times the mass of the Earth, which normally would make it either a gas giant or an ice world, but it's rocky and metallic like that of the Earth. Kind of, and it probably has an ocean of liquid water too. Perhaps as much as 30% of the radius is liquid water. And then my favorite of all are the ones that we can't see. And, and that's the, the, the rogue planets. And, and these are hard to detect. You can detect them by gravitational lensing of a type. Um, and you can also detect them if you, in the infrared, if you're very, very lucky and have a very sensitive detector. But these are planets that float around between the stars. And our estimates now are that there are more of these than there are planets orbiting stars. In fact, the number of rogue planets may outnumber gravitational bound planets by a factor of four to 10. Could life exist on these, inside of them, away from a star? Well, if you look at the planets we just talked about, or I just talked about, uh, you know, from Mars outwards, most of the energy that life would utilize there is not from sunlight. It would be from underground chemicals or trapped thermal energy or phase changes or you know, primordial heat or, or tidal dissipation, many sources of energy are potentially available for life in, in a planet that is dark because you can't see it in reflected sunlight. Um, we're, we're right on the edge. I want to just wrap up with one. You know, I'll use this one to kind of wrap up. We're right on the edge of the release of a lot of information on atmospheric compositions. And you might have heard of a couple of these from the James Webb telescope. Um, the reason James Webb is going to be essential for these studies is because of infrared telescope. It's able to detect with very high sensitivity uh, molecular structure out to beyond 10 microns. And between 1 and 10 microns wavelength of light, there's a whole host of, of chemically interesting molecules that play roles in, in, um, in life on Earth. There, there's a signature of the methane, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, um, you know, hydrogen cyanide, um, uh, and you know, others that you could, you, know, you could go on. A lot of things, the kind of things that we would want to study in detail to determine the sources of, these, uh, of any kind of uh, chemistry that we see. Uh, let's go back to the big numbers again. And this is what I want you to think about. It's going to be clear tonight, right? Yeah. It didn't rain this time. So uh, you go out and you look at the sky. And on average, every star you see, see the wide range of stars, you know, bright blue ones and white ones even, uh, even to, you know, many red dwarfs. On average, that based upon the numbers we have now, there will be two to three giant planets around each star. There will be two to four Earth-sized planets and or moons 
around that star. There will be, on average, two to five habitable locations, either planets or moons. Now, some stars may have nothing, some may have 100, but on average, this is what you're talking about. And these are lower limits. This number keeps getting bigger as we learn more. Okay, I'll stop there, and I apologize for going a little bit. Oh, that was I want to make sure I'll just stand near you with the mic. Sure. I want to make sure we uh, give away another book here and also online, and then we'll take questions. Okay. And you got a coffee? Do you need anything? I don't need anything. Uh, you want this? Uh, sure. I'll take it for a second and then I'll hand it right back. Um, all right. So, Paul, online, I'll ask you to pull another number, and we'll uh, we'll do the we'll do the books here first, and then. Uh, all right. Cal, since you didn't put a ticket in. <laughs> All right, so get your tickets out. Let's see who, who wins the book here. 887. <laughs> hey, Santel. All right, awesome. All right. All right, so you get a you get the uh, the coveted coffee mug. There you go. All right. And Michael sign it, I think. <laughs> um, so, Paul, did you have someone online as well? Yes. Uh, Linda Thomas Fowler was selected by the random number generator. Cool. Linda, congrats. Thanks. And I'm sure we know how to contact you. So, uh, but uh, um, the other person, I think it was Carol, right? Make sure there's something in the chat box that we can contact Carol. We've got we've got Cheryl's contact info too. Sweet. Okay, so we want to take questions then, Mike. If you have a little time, sure. um, and I know we have a few online, right? So yeah. we, why don't we call out the name of the person online, and then uh, Mike, you can just uh, you know, yeah, we'll have them read the we'll have them ask their question, and then you can you can answer. Okay. All right, Jay, ask away. Is he muted? Um, How's that? Cumulus have any Go ahead, Jay. Uh, I had uh, heard somewhere that uh, someone believed that the Earth, I, I don't know if it was a theory or just a notion, that uh, Earth as it is now is not really uh, hospitable for the uh, uh, development of life, uh, but only the continuation of it, and that uh, uh, it, it requires extreme environments to produce life. Uh, do you have any feeling about that or know anything about it? Um, I've heard a lot about it. I don't know much about it, uh, to be honest. But I can tell you what I've heard discussed at meetings. Um, given that all forms of, that given that most forms of life on earth are extremophiles and that extremophiles were the ones that were present when earth when life originated on earth then most likely we had an extremophile as the first organism that's you know that's a plausibility thing that i think is very reasonable since we don't know anything else whether or not you it's you absolutely need an extreme environment to get life we don't know the answer to that um the other part of your question is a little bit tricky. Is the Earth the most optimum for life now or for the Earth to produce life? Uh, I have heard, I have actually seen some quantitative numbers that the Earth is not at, at the peak in terms of, uh, of posting, say, biomass, that probably about 260 million years ago was a little bit higher than it is now, the time of the Cretaceous when the dinosaurs were here. The average temperature of the earth is about 10 degrees warmer. There was no ice anywhere on, on the earth. And so at that point, there was more bio, biomass that was being created and destroyed on an annual basis. So the earth was more habitable then than it is now. Uh, but that's the only solid data that I'm aware of. Probably if we had something going back further into earth history, we might be able to say if there were regions or times when the earth was even more habitable than it is now. Do you need an earth-like planet where there 
an extreme environment or not for the origin of life. Before you can answer that, we need to understand the origin of life. And we, do, I mean, we have a, a lot of good ideas and piecemeal. I think we've got the pieces that, that go into the origin of life, but we haven't put it together in a, in, a, in a train that will drive down a track just yet. So I'm gonna hedge on that one. I don't, I, honestly, I don't have a gut, gut feeling on that either way. Does that help? Oh, uh, yes. I, I mean, it just gives me a little wider perspective on the question at least. Okay. Um, the other question was, uh, has, do you know if anybody has thought deeply about the possibility of non-chemical life? Um, thought deeply about it? Uh, I would say that people have thought a lot about it. Uh, I'm not too sure how, we, how deeply we can think about it since we don't know how it would work. Um, but, you know, there's all sorts of complexity in the universe driven by energy flow through systems. And that complexity can show up as a tornado or a hurricane uh, or a gyre in an ocean or a cell uh, or a complex planet being born. Um, could there be non-chemical life? The, the, only type, the only type that I've read serious peer-reviewed literature on is electromagnetic life. And because there are planets that are mostly metallic planets, 85 to 95% metal, that are way far away from the central star so that the surface and most of their interior is superconducting. And in a situation like that, you would, if you generated an electric or magnetic field, they would be self-sustaining. And you could easily imagine how they could act as molecules that interact chemically, meld together or break apart mimicking chemical bonds, how they could grow uh, and evolve by Darwinian evolution. Um, and it's an interesting idea. And, and there, are there, there are computer models to back it up. But I think that's very, how should I say, it's very preliminary thinking. I wouldn't call that deep thinking at all. Complex modeling, but I'm not too sure we know enough to do deep thinking on it yet. It's interesting though. Very satisfying too. Uh, of course, you have Star Trek and a few other uh, TV shows, I think, have uh, illustrated such things. But Yeah, uh, I, I've, I've heard a lot about silicon-based life. Um, and if, you know, the, the place to look for that is on the moon of Jupiter. I just showed you Io. You have a volcanically active object that's bubbling energy from the inside out all the time. Energy flow galore going through the system and it's made of, of rocks and metals and lots and lots of sulfur and silicon. So a lot of energy flow, got the right materials. Maybe you don't need water for silicon-based life. I don't know, but that would be the place to look right here in our solar system. Anybody tried to attach any of those considerations to the Drake formula? I, I don't know how you would do that because the Drake formula is just a, it's just a what if, you know, what if this is this and what, what you get a, an answer based upon that what if. I, I would put more stock in um, models or, or you know, physics-based models or chemical-based models with uh, numbers to back it up. But no, I'm not aware of that level. Thank you. Uh, let's see, last chance online. If you had a question, uh, type it in there. Uh, and uh, Guy has his hand up. Okay, Guy. Oh, am I on? Yep. Okay. Um, Mike, if you could go back a couple of slides, you had a graph of all the various exoplanets that have been discovered and uh, the uh, distance from the, uh, yeah, that one, okay. Now, this one is out of date, by the way. This is a, maybe, this is maybe 25% or so of all the planets that have been detected. It was just to illustrate the categories. Oh. Well, if it was up to date, mm -hmm. uh, our little planet would be at the far right-hand end of that yellow section. Two, three, be right there. That would be the Earth. And notice how different it is from all the other ones. Yeah, but notice that we can't detect planets at that that are that small around most stars. In, there only we only know of maybe a half a dozen planets at all that are smaller than the Earth. 
uh, the, it's easier to detect big and massive planets than it is to detect small and, and less massive planets. And right now, the borderline is that Earth-sized planets are really, really difficult, unless you're kind of lucky and have several planets, um, similar planets in the same system. Wait a sec. That, that line w where the one is on the y-axis, that's all the ones that are exactly the same size as us. That's, 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 that's hey. one planet right there. That dot is one planet. Yeah, but it goes all the way across the orbital period. Yeah, but th these are these are all Earth-sized planets, but they're not at they're they're at, at closer distances from the star. Too close to the star to be habitable. Okay, yeah. Then so that Earth-sized planet or smaller, at the distance that the Earth is from the sun, is very difficult. Okay. Now, if you have a you have a small star like a red dwarf and an Earth-sized planet, it's easier to detect that, and many of those have been detected with the transit method. And you can even get get detections of those with the the radial velocity method. Am I understanding your question? Yeah, it just the point I was going to make is we just seem really, really unique so far. Uh, now, maybe just a you know an accident of the the geometry that you just it's so hard to find planets like us it, it's hard to find planets that have an orbit that's one earth year that are far away from the central star because the the gravitational per perturbation is much smaller than is if it was up close and and the well just leave it at that it's just harder to detect right i mean this slant right here this is basically the frontier of of our, our instrumentation as the instrumentation gets better this frontier is going to come down like that Within probably 10 to 15 years, we'll be able to detect Earth-sized planets out here to, you know, maybe with out beyond the orbit of Mars. Okay. It will be exciting to watch. It's already exciting. <laughs> Every day there's a new interesting planet. How about here in the room? Right. Thank you. A question that will go to Keith. Just how goes the data from... A spacecraft, you know, approaching, say, the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, infer the presence of liquid water way down under. The water is is salty, and it makes it electrically conducting. And um, Jupiter has a very strong magnetic field. I mean, roughly about ten thousand times the strength of the magnetic field in this room. And um, and so, whenever you have a conducting body. Uh, either having a, a conducting body moving through a magnetic field or a magnetic field moving past a conducting body, you generate electric currents. And those electric currents then, by Maxwell's equations, generate a, 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 an opposite magnetic field. Uh, and you can detect that secondary magnetic field. So you have big time signatures other than gravity. That's right. And in fact, electromagnetism is a very, very precise signature that you can get. If we could pick one of those 10 places in the solar system mm -hmm. and then pick the, Earth, the appropriate extremophile from Earth and take it there mm -hmm. and put it in there, what would happen? And is that ever going to be feasible? Oh, it's already been done. Really? I mean, I mean, Mars, um, I mean, the Soviet Union sent probably 20 spacecraft to Mars that all crashed. They didn't, they weren't concerned at all about sterilizing those spacecraft. I mean, the joke with the Planetary Protection Office is that it's Mars has already been contaminated. Now, for the, the Outer Planets missions, they, they've been much more careful to make sure when the, the missions or the spacecraft are at the end of their life, like Cassini was shot into the atmosphere of Saturn, so it would burn up. With the, the case of JUICE, which is you know, going to be launched next week and we'll study the icy moons of Jupiter, it will be, uh, I think, initially put into the orbit around Callisto and then it will crash into the surface of Callisto because there we think the ocean is so deep that it won't contaminate the oceans. But yeah, we've already contaminated Mars. Well, What's going to happen? There? My question is, would it, could they survive there? Um, I don't see why not. But again, there could be a lot of things I don't see. Yeah, I don't know the full conditions there. That'd be a great experiment. Not if you're a Martian.
Good question. All right, Alex. All right. Is there computational extra biology? I'm sorry. Is there computational extra biology? Oh my gosh! Yes. Training a model of what life looks like. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a big area of the research right now. When I became a planetary scientist, there were nine planets and 300 planetary scientists in the world. Okay, now we know of over 5,000 planets. There are about a thousand planetary scientists in the world, with more planets being discovered every day. You can only do it with statistics, which is what we're doing now, or AI, which is the the burgeoning field. You know, you train an algorithm to search for certain types of patterns. And the patterns can be um, uh, light signatures, it can be spectral signatures, it can, it can be you know, temperature signatures, you know, in, in infrared radiation. It, it can be all sorts of things, but yeah, absolutely. It, especially in exoplanet research. There's a, there's a woman a few offices down who's actually doing it here. Is there any other? If it comes out, you can make a site plan. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Yeah, you started like with an output, I think it was something like 10 to 24 uh, uh, solar systems or uh, Earth sized planets. planets. We'll call it Earth sized planets. Uh, probably have Earth, uh, Earth size. Not conditions, Earth sized planets. Okay, but uh, all the way through the lecture, your, your definition of life is life form. And what many many people general population says that it's intelligent life form. I, 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 you lost me. I'm sorry, you lost me. That, intelligent life forms is a very different matter than absolutely. Life. That's why I didn't talk about intelligent life forms. I know, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Is yeah. It? So I like to try to run through some mm. guesswork on that. Okay. First of all, I would say life form. You know, intelligent life forms like humans on Earth are probably one part in ten to the seventh of four billion years. Or in billion years. How do you know that? Not last forever. How do you know that? So you, mean the, you mean our existence? Four, uh, knock off seven zeros. But then there's also the probability that this, what is, you know, the extraction of especially petrochemicals is uh, a marvelous thing that supports this wonderful life, advanced life form. The probability of the, the sequence of things happening to set up the extraction the way we know it now is probably very, very, very low. Uh, I, would, I would guess knock off, you know, 10 zeros or something like that. Well, I mean, you say probably, but no one knows. No one knows the numbers. People can guess one way or the other, depending yeah, on their biases. Guess right. They're guesses. You don't know. You say, what if? If, it's, yeah. if you guess this, what are the, the conclusions? You do an experiment in labs, this, this environment, what does that produce? I mean, going all the way to intelligence is, is you know, way beyond what I was talking about here. How do you define intelligence? I, I mean, defining life is, is difficult enough. No, I mean, you can guess one way, another person that studies another field can guess another way. I guess my, my basic question, starting with 10 to 24. Earth-sized planets based upon what we've learned so far. If That's you physics, off, numbers. You off seven zeros, but why not two? Times, but why not still get a big what, number? But why not multiply by a number of seven zeros? See, we don't know. That, uh, that's why I was limiting it just to Earth-sized planets based upon the, the data we have in this galaxy, local to us, extrapolated to the, not the whole universe, but the visible universe. I try to be very properly cautious. I don't know why you want to add some zeros, but okay, if you do. You could have 10, have 10 inhabited planets around one star. You could have 40, 000, as many as 40,000 habitable planets in the interstellar medium for every star. I mean, that's the highest number that we see, somewhere between, say, six and 40,000 uh, times. Let me back up a bit. In the interplanetary medium, there's somewhere between six and 40,000 times uh, the number of planets that we know of that are orbit. I would suggest you knock off seven zeros a few times. There's seven million zeros. Either way, you end up with a large number. But we don't know what it means. I mean, sure, you can knock off zeros, you can add zeros, but if you don't know what it means, it doesn't do you any good. All right, we're gonna take one more question. Then we gotta press. Uh, terrific, uh, terrific talk. I'm, I'm really, really impressed. But I'm left with some big questions. Well, all of us are. <laughs> <laughs> Over there. What do, you, what do you think is the likelihood that, you know, if you lived another 100 or 200 years, that your definition of life would have to 
be vastly expanded because of what you have we would have learned well that let me back up i don't want to mislead you we do not have a, a completely adequate definition of life now okay um partially it's due to a context problem um a biologist will have a different definition than a mathematician than a physicist than a theologian than a philosopher than a statistician and so the how you define life depends upon your question to, to yeah. a big degree. Now, even if we limit it just to biology, I, we're learning a lot about biology and simple systems. What do you call viruses? Are they alive or are they not? <laughs> okay, you see the problem. Yeah, we're running up against a continuum from non-life to life. And where do you define that boundary? Or is there a boundary? Maybe it is a smooth continuum. I'm certain that our definition for life is going to be changing, not in a hundred years, but probably in 10 years, maybe sooner. But it's a good question. All right, we're going to leave it at that. I've taken way, way over our time for you. Appreciate way at, yeah. way up my pay grade. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer. So don't leave, don't leave, because Mike's going to be here. We're going to offer books at cost. Uh, super deal, autograph, all that stuff. Mike, uh, you get the uh, you get the uh, the Nobel oh, <laughs> coffee you. cup. Okay, thank you. Which I know. It, it,